Hi, this is Kate, and this is the first video for week 11 of Math 23. This week we're going to be talking a great deal about the derivative, so let's get started. What do we already know? When we have a very basic function that maps from r to r, uh, the linear function that acts on h, this one right here, mh, is represented by the 1 by 1 matrix m. And you may be saying, what, what is m? Well, when we say that f prime, or the derivative of f at a, is equal to m, what we mean is that the function, which is uh, the difference in function values between the function value at a and the function value at a close by point a plus h, is well approximated for very small h's by the linear function mh. So essentially what we're saying is that you may have heard the term local linearity when you zoom in very, very close uh, around a particular point A. The function, no matter how concave or curvy or crazy it looks, as long as it's continuous, you're always going to be able to zoom in enough where it looks pretty much like a straight line. So what more about this mh? Well, of course, it's not exactly perfect. It depends on h and the function itself. So the error that's made by using the approximation is called a remainder. We call it rh. So the remainder, which is a function of that increment h, is equal to the difference between the difference in function values and our example mh, our linear approximation of that. So this is sort of how far off the derivative is from the actual change. And if f is differentiable, if this function happens to be differentiable, this remainder approaches 0 faster than h. So if we take the remainder here, note that this much right here, everything but the minus 8 and minus mh, that's, that's the definition of the derivative here, right? The limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h times f of a plus h minus f of a. That's the, that's the limit definition of the derivative for f prime of a. And so our idea is, well, if we really have found the derivative, we, if we really have found the appropriate mh, if we subtract that off in the numerator, then this should be going to 0 faster uh, than h should be, in which case the limit of this whole thing should be 0. So this is basically saying what uh, my guess for the derivative, this mh. Oh, the difference between that and the limit definition of the derivative is 0, so they must be the same. So this definition leads to the standard rule for calculating that particular number, which is very familiar, the limit definition of the derivative, because we have this mh and we have an h, so the h's cancel. Um, and you can add the m onto the other side uh, where this is 0. So that's just algebraic rearranging. But m itself is the limit definition of the derivative, and this is basically showing that the difference between the two as h goes to 0 is 0. They are one and the same. Now, this gets a little bit more complicated when functions are not just from r to r, but they're going from rn to rm, so you have a lot of different parts to the function, you have a lot of different variables. Well, in this case, we say our linear function is not just going to be a 1 by 1 matrix, our linear function is going to be an m by n matrix. And when we say that f is differentiable at a, we mean that the function, which is still the higher dimensional analog of the difference in function values is well approximated for an h that's sufficiently small by a linear function which we call df of a. So that's der the derivative of the function f at a, but we haven't called it that yet. We're just following the exact same structure that we did up here, down here. So the error made by using this approximation is still the remainder. It is multiple components long. So we're going to bold it. So r, which is a function of the increment vector h, is the difference between, here's the difference between the function values f at a plus h minus f at a, 
and then we subtract off df of a uh, times the increment vector h. And so if f happens to be differentiable, this remainder will go to 0. So if we take the limit uh, as h goes to 0, let's scroll down a little bit here. There we go. If we take the limit as the length of h is going to 0, and we're looking at the difference between the difference in the function values and df evaluated at a acting on h, then we should get 0. And in this case, uh, df at a is represented by the Jacobian matrix jf at a, which you were introduced to last week. Now the proof is sort of short. The way we figure this out is we say, well, we know the derivative exists. That's actually the hard part of this. So we're sort of starting you know, with, with the less complicated pieces. This is saying if the derivative exists, then all these things have this particular relationship. We'll get to existence a bit later, but say L exists. L is that linear function that is the derivative, and it's sufficient to just, since it's a linear function, we can consider its action on each standard basis vector. So you can choose h to be some multiple of the ith standard basis vector. So the length of h is just going to be whatever we multiply the standard basis vector by, which is t. Since we already know the limit exists, we can use any sequence that converges to the origin to evaluate it. So we can just take t goes to 0, right? And by, see, we mean t is going towards the origin. Uh, as t goes to 0, we're going to be taking the limit of 1 over t. Why did we do that? Well, we knew that the length of h was equal to t, and so we're just rewriting this guy up here. So we have 1 over t uh, times f of a plus t times e sub i, since that's our h, minus f of a, minus, and so we know that this particular linear uh, function is t times l times e sub i, because L of h, we knew that h was t times e sub i, so by linearity this is t times L times e sub i. And no, there shouldn't be a question mark here. That's not a question. So how do we get from here to here? Well, all we're doing is taking this t, canceling it with this one over here, and removing this onto the other side of this statement. So all we've done is cancel the t on this term and then solve for l of e sub i. So what is hard is proving that f is differentiable or that this l even exists. This entire process, as I said, already assumes that it exists. We're just showing what it is. And so eventually, we'll prove that f is differentiable at a if all of its partial derivatives are continuous there. But let's talk a little bit about some of the derivative rules, which may or may not surprise you, probably not, but good to review them. Again, we have this function f, which is going from rn to rm. What's important to note is that if this function is constant, then df at a is a zero linear transformation. You can see right here that essentially the derivative there is going to be zero. It's a constant function. Probably not a surprise to you. Uh, if f is affine, which is a constant plus a linear function, then df will be equal to that linear function. So we can show you the breakdown here of taking that limit. Um, f has differential components, so if f has all these different components in it, f1, f2, f3, all the way through to fn, then df will also have these components where we're differentiating each of the components. If f plus g is the sum of two functions, f and g, and they're both differentiable at a particular point, then the derivative of the sum of the functions is the sum of the derivatives. If we have a product 
f times g, where f is a scalar valued function and g is a vector valued function, they're both differentiable, then what we end up with is the derivative of this function, f times g, is equal to f of a times dg at a times b plus df at a times b times g of a. If we have a quotient, g over f, where g is a vector valued function, f is a scalar valued function, they're both differentiable, and f at a, f of a is not zero, then the derivative is going to be, well, this should look pretty, pretty similar to what you would expect, dg of a times v over f of a, and that should actually be f of a squared. So there are a couple typos in here that I'd like to call out and fix. Uh, this should just look like the quotient rule. So that is the quotient rule as you know and probably love it or not, who knows. Um, but there should be an extra parentheses over here, and then this should be squared down here in the denominator. Note that if we have two open sets, u is in Rn, v is in Rm, and a is a point in u at which we want to evaluate a derivative, g is the function that maps from u to v, f is the function that maps from v to Rp. Note that if g is differentiable at a and dg of a would be an m by n Jacobian matrix, and f is differentiable at g of a, and df of g of a is a p by m Jacobian matrix, then the chain rule, which everyone knows and loves so much, says that if we wanted to take d of f composed of g at a, then that would be equal to df of g of a, and this should be a multiplication sign here, just so it's totally clear in your notes. We know that with matrices that that's the same thing as multiplication, but you should note that times dg of a. So the combined effect of all these rules is effectively that, effectively that if a function is defined by well-behaved formulas, no division by zero, no weird discontinuities, then it's differentiable, and its derivative is represented by its Jacobian matrix.